Well, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the first Interfaith Action Program Brown Bag. I am Daryl Ezell, Program Director for Interfaith Action here at Claremont Lincoln University. Uh, we are excited today uh, about first the first Brown Bag, but secondly, the fact of the matter that we have Dr. Donald Swear with us today. Uh, many of you all know Don Swear. Uh, he's an Interfaith Action Fellow here at Claremont Lincoln University. And also, he's currently a uh, distinguished fellow uh, at Harvard University's Center for uh, World Religions. Uh, he's held positions all over the country and also world, uh, from Oberlin College to Swarthmore. Uh, he's currently teaching uh, at the University of the West. And we're excited about having him here today. Uh, in addition to this first project, the, uh, the Brown Bag Project, Don will be involved with us here at Claremont Lincoln University and also the Institute for Religious and Cultural Engagement. Stephanie Varney Hughes will serve as the project developer uh, for the first initiative, the Geo Religious uh, Resources Initiative, and will lead a storytelling project with Dr. Donald Swearer. So, this is an exciting time for us here at Claremont Lincoln University to bring esteemed scholars to the university. And without further ado, Don. Hey. <laughs> well, it's nice to be here, and uh, I've certainly enjoyed my association with you folks and look forward to more time uh, here and doing a variety of things. So I'm glad to pick off the, uh, kick off the brown bag uh, tradition here. So um, <clears throat> Daryl gave me the title of uh, Why Religion, Culture, and Identity Are Important in Public Life. Um, I'm not so sure I'm going to be addressing the why question. Uh, hopefully we'll have time for discussion when the why question might be. Uh, we might sort of address that more, so, but sort of more generally to uh, offer some thoughts about religion, culture, and identity uh, in public life and why I think indeed they are. Uh, important, have been important historically. Um, this is a, a topic, not surprisingly, that has received, you know, a fair amount of attention. And uh, uh, I might mention one recent book that was just published last year under the title Religion and Politics in Europe and the United States, Transnational Historical Approaches. I can give you the, uh, the authors uh, or editors' uh, names later on. Um, so as I was sort of reflecting about this from my experience, obviously, as uh, in the United States and as a U.S. citizen, but also having spent a considerable amount of time abroad, uh, where um, I think the question of religion and politics uh, in general in this country, I think, is a rather fraught question, uh, and it has really been since the very founding of, of our country. And it's uh, continued to be so, and I think it takes on different sort of permutations. Um, that certainly is, has been much less so in the country in Asia where I have spent uh, a good deal of my time studying and researching, doing research in Buddhism, uh, where uh, uh, Thailand is one of the few countries where there is still a living reigning monarch, uh, and he must by constitution be a Buddhist. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, uh, and the question of uh, religion and politics, or in the case of Thailand, Buddhism and the state, or Buddhism and politics, is not a, vet, a vexed question at all, mm -hmm. uh, but it is assumed to be the case. Uh, and I suppose historically, uh, that is, has been a more general tradition than what we see in our country. Whereas from the very beginning, uh, the very founding of the United States, the issue of religion uh, and the state or religion and politics, uh, you know, whether it's Jefferson or it's Franklin, uh, whoever we want to point to uh, was, was, was problematic. In fact, uh, Article 6, Section 3 of our Constitution says, and I won't ask any of you to quote it. <laughs> <laughs> No religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. So um, we weren't really anti-religious 
but so the issue isn't religion per se, uh, and whether one is for or against it, or one is a practitioner or not a practitioner, but it is the relationship between religion and the state that was the issue. Uh, in our more recent memory, and given my age, uh, perhaps closer to uh, uh, as I was approaching adulthood than you young folks, um, if one thinks about the election of John Kennedy, uh, that was actually quite an issue. Uh, the Pope's going to take over the country <laughs> if John Kennedy gets elected. I mean. I think probably we've moved far enough beyond that, so that seems a bit bizarre, but probably it depends on what part of the country you're from mm -hmm. as to whether that seems bizarre or not. Um, and more recently, uh, we have uh, the example of Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly, a Mormon? <laughs> you know, what's that? Uh, we can't have. Uh, a Mormon president, my, my goodness. So um, uh, if, if you recall some of the things that, that Romney uh, you know, said, he clear, clearly tried to distance himself, not from the fact his identity as a Mormon or that he was a Mormon, uh, but the, uh, the role of his own personal faith as a Mormon in relationship to uh, his, political, his political life. So I would say then, as sort of we look at some of these kinds of examples, my own view yeah, would be that in general um, in this country, religion and religious belief uh, is okay. Um, kind of take it or leave it. Uh, but it's okay in, this pri in the private sphere. But it's very problematic in the public sphere. Um, so. It, it, it has, it, in our past, it was not unusual to refer to the United States as a Christian nation. But that was always, you know, fraught with, with, with problematic. Um, we're not a Christian nation as the Christian right. I mean, there, there, there are still large segments of our population who might want to refer uh, to our country as a Christian nation. And we, we tend to refer to them as the Christian right. Uh, and those of us who have a more liberal persuasion, I think uh, that terminology is not a, uh, uh, a terminology of approbation when we, when, we, when, we use that, when we use that term. Um, and, to, and, and not to our credit, I think. I wouldn't say it's to our discredit. Uh, but I think, uh, like any sort of bias or prejudice, uh, we bring a sort of liberal bias or prejudice uh, in, into that. And I think we always need to be cautious about our, our bias, whatever our bias happens to be. Um, just, uh, I was uh, thinking of some examples uh, that, that I might bring to bear. Um, and. Uh, was looking at um, a quotation from David Cameron that, um, in regard to the issue of religion and, and politics that I thought I might share with you. Uh, this is off the internet. Um, what exists in Europe is the politics of identity, including religious identity. In this area, Europe's parties and politicians always think carefully about the signals they send, and getting it right or wrong has consequences. That's a helpful, that's a helpful way to see David Cameron's re-embrace of the Anglican Church. In a column in the Church Times, he advocated, quote, being more confident about our status as a Christian country, close quote, albeit without, quote, doing down other faiths or passing judgment on those with no faith. So, and my guess is that that's a fairly standard view. Um, uh, that is, there's an appreciation, uh, if not more than just a tolerance, I think, probably, an appreciation of uh, a person's, a person of faith uh, as long as it is relative, relatively benign relative to other people. 
So um, uh, Cameron carefully described himself as a, quote, unquote, rather classic member of the Church of England. I always thought of that as fairly indifferent myself. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, quote, not that, regular, not that regular in attendance and a bit vague in, on some of the more difficult parts of the faith. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so the terminology of the politics of identity, I think, is, is useful. Um, um, and, and uh, is a useful perspective, perhaps, to bring, you know, on the question of religion and politics. That is, how, if we bring in the terminology of identity, then how does the bipolarity of religion and politics sort of get cashed out? Uh, and we might think about that in terms of, not sort of out there, but even in terms of ourselves as, as individuals. Uh, take the Soviet Union. Um, uh, Soviet Union uh, espouses uh, a, or more so earlier than today, um, since the 1980s, but clearly from the time of its founding up into the 1980s and, and even beyond today, Marxist ideology is atheistic. Uh, that in itself, I would argue is its own kind of ideology. I mean, to the degree that we look upon uh, a faith affirmation as having an ideological component, uh, it, it very much expands the purview of then we would bring into the picture. It need not be religious in a formal sense, Protestant, whatever, uh, but uh, uh, political as well. Um, I'd like to make just a few comments, uh, given my field, which is uh, Asia and Buddhism, uh, make a few comments now about how the issue of religion and politics gets cashed out or some perspectives on it in relationship to the, to the Buddhist world. Uh, as with the quote Christian West, uh, there is no one pattern uh, in regard to the general question of the relationship between religion, whether it's Buddhism or uh, other Asian religions and the state. Uh, but focusing particularly on the Theravada Buddhist world, which is my world, uh, Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia, um, Buddhism is, I would characterize it as the dominant religion, uh, but it is not the state religion. Although in the, uh, if we look at this, this issue historically, uh, and even in terms of modern history, uh, this has been an issue as to whether or not, particularly in Sri Lanka, as to whether or not Buddhism uh, is not only the dominant religion, uh, but should be the state religion. And there was a move to make it the state religion in Sri Lanka, uh, but um, in, uh, it is a democratic uh, polity. Uh, it, was, it was turned down but it was strongly advocated by um, Buddhist monks uh, who uh, are actually members of parliament um, as, well as, uh, as well as Buddhists uh, outside the political, uh, that, who are not formally part of the political structure. Uh, um, in Burma, um, I mean each each country is, is offers a, a different kind of template or a different kind of perspective on the issue of the relationship between Buddhism or you know religion and politics. Uh, Burma is an interesting case in point because um, uh, having been colonized by the British, um, when uh, Buddhism became when when uh, Burma became or uh, uh, Burma became independent, Myanmar, I should say, using its current term. When Myanmar became independent, uh, Buddhism did in, in fact play an important role in, Burme in Burmese nationalism. Uh, in fact, uh, when I started my graduate studies, there were a sort of a spate of books on Bur that were called Burmese Buddhist nationalism. Um, uh, I would say 
in more recent uh, years, and in fact, more recent days and months, uh, because it's been in our news, uh, uh, there is a Muslim major <coughs> minority, as you know, um, in uh, Western Burma, the Rohingya, uh, and they are Muslims. Uh, and if you follow this in the news, um, there have been serious riots uh, in uh, those Western, the Western state uh, with the Rohingya minority uh, between Buddhists and Muslims uh, and considerable violence. So over 50 uh, Muslims have been killed uh, just in recent weeks. So uh, the issue of religion and politics or Buddhism and politics uh, in terms, it obviously takes many flavors and different, and different perspectives, but it can, as we know, become extremely nasty uh, as uh, in this particular case in, in Burma. Uh, Thailand um, is an interesting case. Uh, it has uh, lacked uh, or I should say perhaps it has not experienced or promoted the kind of religious divisions uh, and antagonism and, 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 and in some cases that we saw violence uh, that, we, that we saw in the case of Sri Lanka or, uh, or Burma. Um, this despite the fact that there is a uh, saying in I'm not sure it's a saying, a phrase, I suppose, is more accurate in Thailand uh, that goes something like this. Ben Thai kok dong ben put. To be a Thai is to be a Buddhist. So to be a Thai is to be a Buddhist. So uh, despite the fact that there has not been the kind of uh, pointed conflict uh, or antagonism between uh, Buddhists and non-Buddhist groups. Um, and this is a very complicated issue because obviously it brings in issues of ethnicity, what kind of ethnic groups are we talking about, and so forth and so on. Uh, nonetheless, there is the ethos, I suppose, cultural ethos, that uh, Buddhism has been and continues to be so important in, in Thailand that there can be this sort of phrase, or fa uh, to be a Thai is to be a Buddhist. Uh, now, when I first went to Thailand uh, after my first year in seminary, uh, I went to teach in a Christian school. Um, uh, the Protestant church in Thailand, the Church of Christ in Thailand, is prim primarily Presbyterian in heritage. Uh, and I went to Thailand as a Presbyterian missionary uh, to teach English in a high school in Bangkok that was founded by Presbyterian missionaries. Um, the uh, uh, Presbyterian, or the, the, particularly the, in the modern period, the dominant Protestant mission group or dominant Protestant group were Presbyterians, and they tended to be um, shall we say non-aggressive. <laughs> uh, it was 15 years before there was one convert uh, by, by the early <laughs> Presbyterian missionaries. Um, and uh, the Church of Christ in Thailand, again, again the Presbyterian heritage there, uh, has grown very, very, very slowly. In more recent years, uh, Th Thailand has always been very open. Um, so uh, not surprisingly, there have been uh, in recent years, uh, more, shall I say, conservative, um, uh, more evangelical-oriented evangelical, uh, folks uh, who have come to Thailand and who have been much more aggressive uh, in evangelistic campaigns and so forth. Uh, by and large, uh, they, they've been, quote, the, their growth has been somewhat uh, uh, more significant than is true for the Presbyterians and the Church of Christ in Thailand. but. Um, not, not, not so much so. I mean, uh, one, of the, one of my favorite Thai sayings, which you hear Thais say all the time, is, oh, my <laughs> something awful happens. My I that's okay. This too will pass. I mean, and, and I've wondered about 
something that is so much a part of not only the vocabulary, but if you will, the mindset and the culture. Uh, as a student of Buddhism, I've wondered if, is this just, you know, Thai character, whatever that is, uh, or, or has, has, has there been some sort of Buddhist influence here? You know, who knows? I don't know. I suppose you could devise a questionnaire that might be able to sort of dope this out in some semi-scientific way. But as I've thought about this casually, I can't come up with any, any, anything significant. But um, uh, a, again, at the sort of general uh, inaccurate uh, cultural observation, you know, the ties are referred to as you know the gentle ties and so forth and so on. Again, is, has Buddhism, you know, been uh, you know part of this or not? Or what? What? Who, who knows? I mean, it's a question that cannot cannot really be answered. But um, I must say that from a, my, a personal point of view, um, uh, one of the great, uh, obviously, it's been extremely important in my life uh, to spend time in Thailand, to study Thai Buddhism, uh, which then in this country, obviously, uh, I've used professionally as a professor of Asian religions, particularly uh, Buddhism, and in particular Thai, Thai Buddhism. But it's been a delightful place to do research um, lots of Thai friends, um, um, and I've always felt totally open and welcome. So perhaps unlike research that one might do uh, in institutional religion and in other religions, I felt, you know, totally welcome. Uh, you come into a temple, you know, as long as you take off your shoes, uh, you, you don't even have to pay the proper respect to the Buddha image, although I do, and any serious researcher would try to follow the customs as much as possible. But, you know, you're, it's like you're a guest. You're, you're a welcome guest. Oh, come in. Uh, I recall a, one time when Nancy and I uh, had taken a trip to uh, a town not so far outside of Chiang Mai in northern Thailand where we do most of our research, and there was a big festival going on. Uh, you know, lots of procession and so forth. So we parked the car and jumped out of the car and you know, following the festival, I was taking my photographs. Uh, and of course people, you know, grabbed us and said, oh, you know, come with us, come with us. Well, come for dinner, come for dinner. So, you know, we go for dinner. Oh, come back tomorrow morning for breakfast. <laughs> uh, the kind of uh, hospitality, I guess, is the right word that we've experienced in Thailand has been just absolutely unbelievable. So. Uh, it certainly added to the pleasure of doing uh, research in a, in, a, in a country like that. Um, I might just make a few uh, closing comments about uh, Buddhism in this country. Uh, uh, it is the third largest, numerically the third largest religion in the United States. Uh, after the Protestant Christian and one Catholic Christian, uh, the next largest group is Buddhist. Now, it's divided into two parts. That is, there's the immigrant, um, or the uh, what is sometimes referred to as the export Buddhist, Buddhist group, immigrant group, and then there's the import. Uh, so that is Westerners who become Buddhists. And, uh, that, that's a sizable group uh, uh, and an important group in terms of uh, helping to define and focus um, uh, Buddhism in America, even though sec in terms of Buddhist sectarian development, uh, it's diverse. I mean, uh, but nonetheless, as a group, uh, it, is, uh, it is, is a large group. So a 2007 Pew survey uh, came up with a group of one and a half million Buddhists in this country, uh, divided, as I said, between the import uh, or immigrant Buddhist group uh, uh, and the non-immigrant group. Uh, not surprisingly, the immigrant group uh, reflects the kind of Buddhist sectarianism uh, that one finds in Asia. Uh, so there is a sizable uh, diversity, uh, Buddhist sectarianism uh, in this country, defined 
for the most part, or rooted, I should say, uh, for the most part, ethnically. So there's Thai Buddhists. Well, they're Theravada Buddhists, but they're Thai Buddhists. Uh, or there's Tibetan Buddhists, and they're Vajrayana Buddhists, but you know they're Tibetan, uh, and so forth. Um, uh, so we can talk. We can talk about contemporary Buddhism in the United States uh, denominationally, and people do write about it in those terms. So there's the Theravadins, there's the Mahayanists, there's the Vajrayanists, uh, but uh, it probably is more helpful, actually, uh, to think about these distinctions uh, ethnically, or if you will, uh, in terms of Tibet, you know, Tibet, Thailand, and, and, and so forth. Uh, now, uh, I think I've asked some of you about, about this, if you have visited the Fo Guangshan Shilai Temple uh, in Hacienda Heights, but uh, if you haven't, uh, I would strongly urge you to do it. <laughs> it, it, it is a marvelous place, uh, and, and, and go there uh, 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 over, over lunchtime, <laughs> and, and you can get a, a marvelous vegetarian, vegetarian meal. Uh, probably the veg best vegetarian meal you would get around here. <laughs> so, uh, but it, it's very, it's very interesting place, um, and I would uh, urge you to go and spend some time. You know, don't just go and you know snap a, a photo. And it is there's lots of good photos there, uh, but um, people are very open. Uh, they're eager to. Uh, to share with you, um, so I would I would I would urge you to do that. I had two nuns in my um, class that I taught last year at the University of the West, uh, and they were, you know, delight thoroughly delightful. So uh, um, I think that's about all I uh, need to say. The, the temple itself was founded. It it is a Chinese lineage, but it's headquartered in Taiwan. Uh, the Fo Guangshan Shilai Temple, uh, Master Xin Yun, um, who came in 1976, or he founded the temple in 1976. Does that year have a familiar ring? 1976? And he founded it in 1976 specifically for that very reason that it was 1976. Hmm. The bicentennial? The bicentennial. Really? Oh, yeah. So, uh, Buddhism so has a future in the United States. Wow. Here is the second founding of our country. Wow. <laughs> uh, so visit. It's 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 really a great place. Okay? Good. <laughs>
it, it seems to be more out there. I mean, it's clearly more on the news. Um, whether uh, it plays a more influential role, which is the direction of your question, I just don't don't have the information. What What are your thoughts? I I, I mean, having so I'm 59 years old, and what I've witnessed in my life is it seems to be more and more an issue, even though I know it always was. And I believe one of the candidates who ran against um, FDR, was, was his name, Al Smith, mm -hmm. was a Catholic, and that was an issue in his election, too. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of resistance to him being elected as a Catholic. But there seems to be more pandering to the religious right, and it especially seemed to flourish during the Reagan administration, yeah. and, and seemed to have backed off during the, the Democratic administrations, that could totally be my bias in interpreting that. But I was wondering if you would track that at all. I haven't tracked it at all. And I'm sure, it, 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 because it seems like such an obvious issue in question, I'm sure it has, been, it has been studied. I just haven't. It's not something that I've looked at. But my sentiment would be your, your sentiment, that uh, it's become more visible, more apparent. Um, so if, to the degree that there's any kind of read on on reality there. <laughs> yeah, I, I should think so. Yeah. And whether or not it's always been there and it's just sort of more out on the table now, uh, it was more problematic to talk about it uh, and less so now. I, I, a very interesting issue. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed, but there was a lot of surprise at the table when you said that Buddhism was the third largest mm -hmm. religion no. in this country. Yeah. What one might have thought, what, Muslims, uh, Islam? Uh, but well, Jews, but they're small population. Well, no, Jews are second. Okay. Oh, did, oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I, 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 dis, I, I divided the Christian population. Okay. So it's, it's uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm still, I'm, I think I'm right on this now. My memory isn't failing me. Uh, let me stick with what I said initially. Uh, it is Protestants, Catholics, Buddhists, and Jews. So Judaism is fourth. I believe that is correct. You might want to check me out to see, but I think that is, I think I'm right. It is smaller than you would think, considering how, how visible Judaism is in this country. Yeah. Yeah. I, think it's about, I think because a lot of Jews have emigrated to Israel. And there's also but, an awful lot of Judaism in business media right uh, so there and those are the things that we spend a lot of time attention on right yeah. right yeah i want to uh, ask a quick question sure, sure you could even ask a less quick question okay. <laughs> that's a long question <laughs> where do we start in trying to orchestrate a conversation between religious actors and political actors you know, your work in southeast asia you've seen this up front, mm -hmm. and the new conversation now is about how interfaith actors or individuals who are members of the interfaith movement yeah. might be able to lend their expertise and support in resolving these new conflicts that we see. So mm -hmm. how can we pair both sacred and secular actors together in mm -hmm. conversation? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let, let me make a comment which is somewhat uh, by the by, relative to the way you asked the question, um, I think when we talked about this briefly before, I mentioned this friend of mine uh, in Thailand uh, by the name of Sulak Siwarak, uh, who is a layperson, um, is a very devout Buddhist, uh, and is a, uh, a committed political activist. Um, and. Um, if I look at him as an example, um, he, he not surprisingly operates on a number of number of fronts. Um, uh, he publishes a lot, um, and a lot of what he publishes is, is sort of in the popular press. Uh, it's in the newspaper media. It's in, in popular books. Uh, he also cultivates relationships um, with a wide range of figures, including political figures. Um, so I think the general question is, uh, apropos again the way you ask it or put it, uh, you know, how do you how do you uh, you know get out there in 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 the public sphere uh, so that uh, it becomes uh, a in a sense non 
this may not quite be the right word, but a kind of non-controversial level of discourse. Uh, and I think what we're overcoming here, again, in this country is uh, this, this, to put it mildly, uh, the hesitance we, hesitancy we have of bringing religion, uh, putting religion on the table. Uh, we somehow think, again, whether it's the public-private thing or if you're religious, you've got to be biased, you can't have an open mind. I mean, what, what is the sort of cultural um, lens that we put on when we raise this kind of a question? And maybe that's the way to start uh, and then try to disabuse, dis disabuse uh, whoever the group is or whatever the audience is. That, that we, I mean, it's just tragic that we can't, you know, have a, a dispassionate conversation about these kinds of issues. Yeah. Because it's so darn important. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see the world's religions as being truly that much in conflict with each other? I think, again, I think, the, I think you can't put it that way. Uh, I mean, I think you've got to look at political, I mean, at, at, at particular situations. So two of the examples that I raised in terms of Buddhism is uh, Western Burma or Myanmar uh, and in Sri Lanka. And uh, I think I made the point when I, when I use those examples is that we, we then, when we contextualize religion in that way, we see all of these other factors that are being brought in. Economic, mm -hmm. ethnic. Uh, religion is never out there by itself. It's always embedded uh, in these kinds of variables. Uh, and sometimes those variables uh, are non-confrontational and non-conflicted. In other cases, they, they are. And oftentimes, uh, and again, historically, one can look at some of these examples, Someone's got to light, light a match. But all this stuff is sort of, you know, bubbling along there. Somebody lights a match, boom. And then it becomes, you know, violent or it becomes a big issue. Uh, but a lot of stuff is there under the surface. But that's it a pattern, come. I think. I mean, if you look at Joan of Arc and some of the ancient wars, they were all, it wasn't until, you know, we felt like God was on our side and then people would burst yeah. forth and start fighting. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yeah. something, something sets it off. Whether it's a person or an incident, um, yeah. yeah. How do we parse out? How do you parse out issues of power and privilege with North American, like white Buddhists? Because we have privilege as consumers to fetishize the other and to go into Barnes and Noble into the Buddhist section and and take what we can and, and claim and and even become scholars and leaders in communities um, without any knowledge of language or culture or relationship with, with indigenous people? Yeah. No, I think it's a really good question. And uh, I don't know how one, um, again, to use, I mean, one of the distinctions that I mentioned is between, you know, import Buddhism and export Buddhism. Um, you know, we walk into the supermarket and we kind of, you know, take what we want and we put it in our basket. Um, I don't see any way really of, of overcoming that uh, unless um, some of, I mean, this is rather trite and perhaps superficial, but um, so if some of the so-called leaders in the Amer or who are looked upon as leaders or major figures in the American Buddhist field, like Robert Thurman, for example, um, I mean, Thurman himself is, is thoroughly grounded in Tibetan Buddhism. He does the languages. He was ordained as a Tibetan monk. Um, so he does not represent that sort of superficial. Um, but I, I, I don't know how to... Um, and, and one thing I didn't mention that, that is, I think in terms of your question plays a, a big, big role is we're a meditator. I'm a meditator, right? And so I go in and I do a little satipatthana. I do a little kind of mindfulness meditation. Uh, and it may be in a context that, uh, you know, considers itself Buddhist, but, you know, that's about, that's about it. Uh, it may even begin with, uh, you know, the recitation of a sutra. Uh, but again, you know, it's just part of the, uh, it's part of the liturgy or it's part of the dress. Um, so, you know, I think one could say this, I suppose, about any 
religion. You know, how do you make it significant in terms of what you really know about the tradition? Um, and I think it will always be the case that there will be some at the, let's use a word like superficial, at the very superficial end, uh, and there, there will others be others who are I mean, looking at it from the standpoint of, of Buddhism uh, and, and the development of Buddhism as a tradition in the broadest sense. Uh, what is sad about this kind of thing is that that has no effect on the develop, development of mm. tradition. It doesn't enrich it at all. Um, so to the degree that a more de- in-depth kind of involvement and thoughtful involvement um, can help, uh, as if not redefine, we might use a word like redefine, but help it grow and deepen. Uh, and if we look historically at the way religions have developed, uh, that's, that's always been or not been the case. So uh, some of the major turns in any religious tradition has been when there's been that kind of thoughtful engagement and transformation. And so Luther comes along, right. <laughs> for example, to right. use a pretty well-known example. So it'd be like if I had a statue of the Virgin Mary in my house and I collected rosaries and I lit candles, but I didn't actually participate in the life of the church yeah. and lend my voice as laity yeah. in, that, in that community. Yeah. 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 Is it also true, I mean, the encouragement to go and visit the temple, it isn't just an intellectual thing, but when you are physically in a building in the surrounding, that has an impact on you. And from the West, we tend to do everything from an intellectual um, perspective versus just being in the presence of it and rediscovering them. I think that's, for me, that's what the sure. Asian cultures offer is. It's, sure. I'm not doing it from a perspective in being intellect. Yeah, and that takes time, and, and I mean, it's really difficult if you think to the degree that you can divest, divest yourself as as much intellectual baggage as you bring to any experience <coughs> and, and let whatever the environment is or whatever it is sort of for you to absorb it. Um, so, you know, to go and spend some time there and uh, I think uh, you would find that, uh, particularly the nuns, I think probably the, uh, the monks or the priests, it would be similar if you could find someone who spoke a decent amount of English. Um, they're obviously happy to engage, engage you because obviously they're interested in, in your interest and want to encourage it. And, uh, I have a Laotian friend. So I've been to this temple several times with her, but I've been to other Buddhist temples that we, and they're all a different experience. That's right. It's just interacting with her and her culture that is so transformed yeah. me. We don't have intellectual conversations about it, but yeah. I've learned so much yeah. just by engaging with her. Um, Where is the Laotian temple located? Um, it's in the valley, the San Fernando Valley. I can find uh-huh. out for yeah. you. Yeah. I don't, I've been there. I don't know how to get there because she yeah. So. Yeah. There's also one... And I don't know what ethnic group it is, but it's in Los Angeles on First Street. Um, I've been there for New Year's, yeah. the Chinese New Year's. It's very small, and they always have food outside. <laughs> um, you, you know there's a Thai monastery or Thai temple yes. in, here in Claremont. Uh, well, I didn't know it's here. In, in Claremont. It's, it's on Indian Hill. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, do you know where Mix Bowl uh, well, you don't know Mixed Bowl Restaurant? Oh my, this may be the most important thing I said this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... Yeah, just below. Hey, my pleasure, my pleasure. Glad, glad to have the opportunity to be here. Wonderful. Yeah.